All right, today um, we are now at the Library of Congress. Uh, my name is Susan Callow, and the date today is March 22nd, 2003. And finally, after many conversations together, I get the pleasure of meeting you in person, Jim. So um, this is going to be your story for the Veterans History Project for the Library of Congress. So. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, just for the record, would you please state your name and spell your name? Yes, James Kenneth Brutum Jr. Last name is spelled B-R-U-T-O-N. Okay, and your branch of service and rank? I was uh, Army Infantry and I transferred to Special Forces. I left uh, service as a Lieutenant Colonel. Okay, fantastic, fantastic. So kind of winding back because um, always curious about what led you to the service what was going what, did you have other family members in the service or what was going on in your life that led you to um, to the army World War two my I'm from the south my parents are from the south and during the war my father served in the Army Air Corps which was stationed here just in the US he was assigned to New York and that's when I came along, 1944. I was born in a military hospital at a place called Fort J, Governor's Island, New York. Fort J is no longer there. And the army, or rather the government sold uh, Governor's Island to the state of New York. So it, it's hmm. differently yeah. configured right now. Uh, my father, when, as I said, he was in the, in the Air, Army Air Corps. I happened to have six uncles on both sides of the family who served during the war. Of those six, one remained in as an army doctor. So, but there was no, it was just something that what, what people did at that time during the war. Did you, did you have conversations with them? Were you interested back yes, then? Yes, I was very curious about okay. what they did and, and they were open about it. But none had uh, longings to be back in the military as far as I know. So they weren't encouraging you? Or they weren't discouraging me, but they mm -hmm. didn't, uh, it wasn't something that uh, they harped on about. Okay, and when, so when was it that you finally uh, Well, ROTC, I, was at, I, went, I attended a university named after two generals. I went to Washington and Lee University in Lexington, Virginia. It happens to be right next to the Virginia Military Institute. And it had a strong ROTC program. And during my time there, I started uh, thinking about what am I going to do upon graduation? Had, I would have graduated with an economics degree, but how, how do you turn that into a, to a, to a job? And things were heating up in Southeast Asia. I always had a st strong wanderlust and wanted to uh, travel and see the world. And the Army seemed like an exciting thing to do at the time. So I chose infantry as my branch. I graduated in 66. I wound up at Fort Benning, jump school, then signed with the 82nd Airborne. And a year later, almost a year later, I was, I was in Vietnam. I want to mention something that's, uh, uh, I think, relatively important. Uh, I was selected to be an advisor to the South Vietnamese, and this required attending a course at Fort Bragg, Military Training Assistance Advisory course, which was uh, very helpful. It had a lot of cultural information, mm -hmm. plus it included uh, Vietnamese language. And it was six, six weeks of Vietnamese language at Fort Bragg, and then another six weeks or two months at Fort Bliss, Texas, which was an extension of the Defense Language Institute. So uh, I got a very basic exposure to the language, and I think that was one of the most helpful things that happened to me during my time there, because uh, I was able to, I, I did not, after I got my language done and, 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 and practiced it with, the, with my counterparts, and constantly asking, how do you say this, how do I that right, and so forth, um, I felt very comfortable using it and operating with ordinary people in the country. And psychologically, it was a real plus because unlike the overwhelming majority of uh, servicemen in Vietnam, I did not feel separate from or alienated from the people to the extent that they did. I mean, South Vietnam is a different culture, mm -hmm. and they weren't properly prepared for it for the most part. That's one of my pet rocks. You mean that the, the Americans? The Americans were not prepared for it. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, many of the commanders did not see the value in cross-cultural preparation. They were there to kill the enemy. Mm. So 
uh, that was one of, one of our weaknesses, and it still is. The same thing happened in uh, Iraq and in Afghanistan. I mean, there, there are efforts made to correct it, but overall we've never dealt with that problem in, in our uh, military forces and in, and, and in the government as a whole. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the Foreign Service has problems that should not be present. Uh, but that's, that was just something that, that I, 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 uh, I picked up on during my experience there. Mm -hmm. A little, different, a little different depth in your approach. Yeah. I was in Vietnam for two years. It was a one-year tour, but I liked being an advisor. I felt I was doing something worthwhile. Mm -hmm. And I extended for six months. When you, when you voluntarily extended in Vietnam, it was a six-month, uh, six not a one-year commitment. And I chose to go to the South Vietnamese Airborne Division. It was the, one of the, it's the best... Uh, outfit in Vietnam on the South Vietnamese side. Uh, a lot of experienced officers and NCOs. Uh, they fought well, had a good record. And of course there's a flashy aspect to it. When uh, we weren't in the field war, we red berets and camouflage fatigues of our Vietnamese counterparts. And so uh, it, it, it was a little bit, it had a prestigious <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, air about it. And I served with them for actually that's about seven months. And it, it was an experience. In fact, Right now, I belong to an association of South Vietnamese Airborne Advisors. They are served with the division. We, we uh, have conventions, reunions, every approximately every two years. COVID knocked our schedule off, but uh, we have reunions. And uh, we see some of the, well, some of the aging officers now mm -hmm. that were present back during the war. And uh, it's, it's been, we're having worked with South Vietnamese Airborne was one of the uh, my one of the proudest associations I, I've had in, in, in my entire life. That's great. So you were, you maintain the relationship. Oh yes, yeah. We we That's great. Uh, we, we, we 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 remain in, in contact. In 1971, I attended the officers infantry infantry officers advanced course, which is for captains for the most part. And there was a major there. Let me back up. I think about 160 officers were in that course. Of those, about 20, 2018 were air lad officers from different countries, South America, Africa, different, different, different countries. Uh, we had a large contingent of Vietnamese officers, and uh, one was a major from the Vietnamese Air War Division. And uh, I was his sponsor. I chose to be a sponsor. Sat next to him and gave him assistance as needed. He was very good, he, he, had, he, he graduated with a very high grade point ratio. Anyway, uh, he went back and really distinguished himself during the war. He, he died several years ago, unfortunately. He moved to California, but he died several years ago. But also in that course, well, four Lao officers, uh, and they were captains at the time. I got to know several of them. And one of them I would wind up meeting again and having and interacting with when I was in, in Laos. Who was that? His name was Cal N.C. Yang Mai, yes. whom you know. Yes. Let's see what happened next. After, let's see. How did you get assigned over there? Was that a choice or yeah. was it as a result of that Infantry course? branch came down and asked, said, well, you, it's, you fill out a dream, it's called a dream sheet, where you'd like to go. Mm -hmm. Half the time it's ignored, but uh, <laughs> I wanted to go back to Southeast Asia, as I put it. I, I wanted to go back to where people eat rice, and I was stupid, let's, let's face it, because there are occupational hazards to being there. But uh, I volunteered for Special Forces, mm -hmm. wound up in Special Forces Thailand, assignment there uh, that, that uh, was considered a very desirable assignment by many people. First of all, Thailand's nice. Mm -hmm. People like Thailand. Mm -hmm. And the missions were extremely interesting and very challenging that the unit was performing. It was, at the time, it was called 46 Special Forces Company. And then in a reorganization, it got renamed a battalion. Not much changed except the name. Mm -hmm. What made it, just to go back, what made it so interesting? Or can you give an example? Yeah, the, the mission, the mission. Uh, the Thais were engaged, well, we were helping the Thais in counterinsurgency. There was a communist uh, conducted insurgency in northeast Thailand, supported by uh, the North Vietnamese, mm -hmm. and to some, ex to some extent by the Chinese. And 
we, we were helping their army uh, learn to deal with that. There were other missions. We trained their, a, unit, a unit of theirs called the Border Patrol Police to help maintain security along the border. Of course, they were facing Laos, which had its own communist problem, and Cambodia too. Um, and then we worked with uh, some of their specialized units. They, they, they had an airborne battalion, a ranger battalion, a scuba battalion. And so our, our people worked with those, with those uh, particular units. And of course, they had their special forces uh, unit, Thai special forces. And uh, they, they, they performed well also. But just an interesting experience being there. So but I also learned basic Thai while I was there, and that, that, that proved helpful when I was in Laos. Here's how Laos came along, because I know you were about to ask that. Uh, I was a, an assistant operations and training officer. That makes sounds elevated, but I was just, a, was just another action officer doing, you know, a bunch of officers doing different, different tasks. And the commander uh, made a change in the lineup, we had just sent two Special Forces A teams to Laos uh, to help train uh, regular Lao units, help, help strengthen the Lao army, because we knew we, sooner or later the U.S. was going to pull out of Southeast Asia. I'm sorry, what's the difference? What, why do you say regular? As opposed to irregular, like guerrilla, guerrilla warfare. Okay. Uh, it's regular versus guerrillas. And uh, the commander lost confidence in one of the A-team commanders, called me to his office, thought I'm going to shoot out about something, and he told me I was taking over that A-team. So I, I, uh, I uh, flew to uh, Udorn and then uh, I eventually joined the team. Uh, here's how we were organized. The two A-teams, the team that I commanded was, was split, about six, six men in different locations. I had what well, six men under me were assigned to a site in southern Laos uh, called Wat Pu, Wat means temple. And there was a camp that the CIA had built at one time, had a little landing strip in it that could accommodate uh, these powerful single engine, uh, they look like Piper Cubs, but they're not Piper Cubs, they're very powerful, the lattice porter aircraft. The other half of my team was up north of a training camp that had been there called Pu Kau Kwai in the mountainous area. And they, they trained, uh, many of their trainees were from different hill tribes in Laos. The second A team had all, all four men, all, all full 12 men uh, in, in its lineup, went to a location called Seno, S E N O, uh, which is near. Uh, Savannah Ket, major city in central Laos on, on sitting on the, on, the, on the Mekong. I think Seno stand in, in French stands for north, east, southwest. It's, mm -hmm. not, it's not a Lao name, it's the name of, of a site. And they worked with a, a division there. It, the Lao army was forming a, what's called a strike division. It was intended to react to different events in the country. So they were kind of a ready force that could go where they were needed. During my time there, we worked with two, they were called groupement mobile, French word, which essentially think of, just think of a regiment. And each groupement mobile had uh, three battalions and an interesting variety of experience. So one of mine was, had, it was a battalion parachutist 104. But I, I don't think that many, I don't think many men at, at, at that time were, were, were parachute qualified. That was a, just a traditional name. We had a, <coughs> a three-month uh, training program. By training, we in, in in the team did not conduct classes that often. In fact, it was rare. But we monitored the conduct of classes by the by the Lao. And uh, some were very good. We didn't understand the language, of course, but some were very good, and it, we could tell whether they were holding the attention of the students. And uh, many of them had been trained in the U.S., gone to U.S. schools, and had had additional training in, in Laos. Uh, some that, that, that 
U.S. had, had uh, sponsored. So the overall the goal was to slowly increase the capability of the Lao Army through better training, through giving their officers uh, training in the U.S. And I think over time that, that program would have made a lot of difference. Mm -hmm. I can cite several uh, events that took place during, during my time in Laos. Uh, after the first three months, after our first training cycle, it's uh, traditional to go on a field training exercise, an FTX, to go out and, and, and to uh, try to apply what, what you've learned, hopefully, been hopefully learned. We went out, and it was it turned out to be an unintended live fire FTX. Oh, wow. We ran through a uh, Path at Lao, that's the communist element, a, a Path at Lao contingent. And one of the battalion commanders who, had, who, who was in the lead had an unusual technique. His, this, this, is not, this is not textbook, but he always had a man close to the front element, the point element, who carried a 57 Corliss rifle. That's for knocking out tanks. It's very powerful. It has a big black bat, big back blast. It makes a lot of noise. But whenever we, if several occasions, we the, the lead element walked into an ambush. The 57 cross rifleman just fired his uh, rifle. Well, that's not a rifle, so it's <laughs> over half an inch. Mm -hmm. But he, uh, that's, that's that's two inches. 57 millimeters is two inches. Over two inches. Okay. And completely broke the ambush. We wound up capturing uh, two detainees, and of course the rest fled. But I've never seen that. But I've never seen it. <clears throat> and another site, uh, we, we visited some local self-defense areas, uh, and a commander there had a 106 recoilless rifle. That's a big anti-tank weapon. It's usually mounted on a, a, a jeep, or it could be mounted on an armored personnel carrier, or or a special platform. Well, it's a direct fire weapon from the tube to the tank. And they learned how to fire it in an indirect fire mode. It goes up form in a trajectory and comes down on the intended target. And they seem to be fairly good at it. I'd, I'd, I'd never seen that before. So it wasn't aimed at a tank, it was no, simply aimed at... That's right, it's used as an indirect fire weapon. Mm -hmm. Kind of like a mortar. So I mean, it works. The, the, the lesson learned is that uh, we can always learn something from the indigenous folks. We don't know it all. Mm -hmm. And give them a chance to show what they can do. So, uh, What was the terrain like? When you were <sighs> Generally speaking, we were on the, though we were Laos, we were on the western side of the Mekong, at that part, part of Laos. You know, open fields, rice paddies, uh, there was a lot of thick vegetation in areas, uh, but it, well, I wouldn't call it jungle. It just, it, it, just more of a forested area than, than a jungle where I was. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, flat. But there were mountains. You could see mountains around. We, our, our team house was an old French design building. And at night, we could sit on the on the on the porch, and look to the east, and we could see flashes along the horizon. Those are B-52 strikes along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. One thing we did that, that was very personally rewarding for me, uh, we met, well, first of all, uh, we had a, an, another American working with us. He was a military attaché, assistant military attaché, who'd been assigned there. He'd been, he'd been to Lao language school, so he spoke the language well. And he made, uh, made contacts throughout the area to include the chief political heads in the nearby city, the, the, the capital of that region, the, the traditional capital of that region, called Champasak. This was the Na Champasak family, and they produced uh, several uh, princes and others who'd, who'd manned the government, worked in the government. The area, that area had been a part of the old Khmer Empire at one time, 1400s during that, during that period. And the Cambodians had built a temple there 
that resembled Angkor Wat, though it was much smaller. So we had a temple there right, right, right as part of our compound. <laughs> and eventually the Lao became the dominant uh, force in that area. And the dominant family was the Nachapasak family. So we uh, uh, got to know, maybe not the, the, the head of the family, but uh, uh, that'd be Bunum Nachapasak, but uh, I think it was a good Om Nachapasak. Well, we, we, we made friends, at least established contact with the, uh, with the royal family, the, the royal family of that part of Laos. And somehow we made, we, we found out about a local shaman who uh, would take a, take some kind of potion you know, and go into a trance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He would tell people's fortune. But he may have he had a, something, we call it hepatitis, uh, bowl, made of some type of uh, herbal remedy, and he had a stick with a, with a nail at the end, and he would poke us on the, you know, on, on our exposed areas to make us bulletproof. Oh. And there was a ceremony, a Lao ceremony called a, a bachi, and it's stuff of different occasions, weddings and good luck events or whatever. So we have a bachi, and it Includes wrapping string around your wrist, and 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 the the shaman would uh, again poke us with his uh, hepatitis needle, and uh, I, I'm not I'm not making fun of him. That's how that's how that's mm -hmm. how we, no, we refer no, to it. Serious. It worked. It, yeah, it worked. Uh, we, we survived. <laughs> so uh, the live fire FTX is one of the unexpected events. Mm -hmm. And also just, just going into the city like Champasak and getting to ordinary people. We found a restaurant that we liked and, and, and a bar that we liked and stuff like that. It was, it, 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 we got to mix it up with the people and that was, that was quite, quite enjoyable. All right, getting back to my... What was it safe then at that time? Right? I don't know what year exactly this, this was. This is 70, 72. This took place in 72. So it must have been fairly calm for that royal family or where they lived? Or at the time, away there, from the conflict? There, there was fighting going on around there, but not. Mm -hmm. uh, there was one uh, year when, when the people in, in that area felt threatened. Uh, that's when uh, Pak Se was, uh, felt an attack was coming, but uh, uh, they, they were, it was fairly safe there. Now, that, there were Prophet Lao elements in that area, but they were there was, there was there to observe what was going on. There wasn't any combat uh, in, that, in that immediate area. Our, our, our live fire FTX was the only contact we had with the Pocket Lao. We had another training cycle and a FTX following that, and uh, there was no, it, it, no, no live fire whatsoever. Now, one thing that happened during the, my time there, uh, there was a major battle in the, well, in the northern, northwestern part of the, of the province, or of the, of the military region, it wasn't a province, uh, that my advanced course classmate, Cal, had a big role in. The North Vietnamese, not, not Path of Lao, North, North Vietnamese attacked a uh, city called Kung Sedong. And that set on, on the highway between Pak Se and Savannah Ket, two major cities. Two group mobiles, two regiments, one commanded by Cal, took their time and over a three month period uh, decimated two North Vietnamese regiments that had uh, uh, taken, a, taken Kung Sedong. And after Kung Sedong, they realized they needed uh, anti-tank training. My team got reinforced by some more uh, SF uh, uh, sergeants from, from, from Thailand. And we provided anti-tank training to, uh, particularly to Cal's regiment. And that came in handy at another time. He, in a, in a subsequent battle around, I'm gonna say around December, I hope that date's right, he knocked out, his, his men knocked out uh, five North Vietnamese tanks. Now that was a big, big 
event in Laos. So these were tank, these were North Vietnam coming down using the Ho Chi Minh Trail with intentions to get into Vietnam? Intention, no, inten intentions to knock out the Lao. Mm -hmm. this, was, this was an attack on the Lao. Okay. Because the Lao were a nuisance. Now I haven't mentioned the, in, the entire, or anything about the special guerrilla units. In the 1950s, the U.S. recognized that it'd be very difficult to try to upgrade the Royal Lao Army. It had, had a different name at the time, but, but, the, the, but the Royal Lao Army, because they, they, were, they did not have a, 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 they'd been a French protectorate, not a colony, a French protectorate. And they hadn't had a, a strong military tradition that was institutionalized. So, uh, over time, yes, they, they could be trained and, 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 and modernized and, and, and improved. And an officer, a professional officer corps could have been established. But until that happened, the uh, army was a fiefdom or, or, or of, of different of rival families trying to use it to, mm -hmm. to advance themselves. Mm. And to deal with the threats that the country had, that is from, from the Vietnamese communists. The U.S. decided that uh, there was a, a warlike group in, in, in the country, namely the Hill Tribesmen, because they've been fighting for their survival for a long time. And some of these were the Hmong. So the CIA uh, began a program working with the Thais to train the uh, Hmong and others into what became known as the Special Guerrilla Units. And they were trained in small unit operations that uh, conduct reconnaissance, road watch, see what's going on on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, Sammy are moving down the trail, count trucks, and sometimes to call in airstrikes. The SGUs were a very unusual force and that it was one of the only, the only guerrilla uh, army in the world that had air support, mm -hmm. namely from the U.S. Air Force. So that, that was the other thing Jim, I was going to ask you, who were you, who were you getting your orders from? Who was it? CIA? Was it Ar What was the chain of command for you? Good question. Uh, since 1964, the all the military activity on the ground required the approval of the U.S. ambassador in Laos. That was an unusual situation. So it was called the Ambassador's War, and things had to be coordinated uh, through him. So he, he put a stamp of approval on the different operations that, that, that occurred there. Do you remember a name or did he well, change? Well, see, uh, Sullivan's the one that comes to mind. Uh, the, uh, I remember G. McGuthrie Godley, uh, who was there at my time. And the last one was a man named uh, White House, uh, from St. Charles White House. His son happens to be the Senator Sheldon White House from uh, Delaware. Let's see, where was it? Okay. Over time, the special guerrilla special guerrilla program uh, expanded and included not just Hmong, well, here whole tribes, but included Lowland Lao. And some of the best units happened to come out of the Savannah Cat area where Cal lived. There are a number of operations they conducted that were spectacular but are not well known. One sergeant found out that uh, there, were, there was a POW camp. It was in northern part, was in northern part of Laos, or toward the north, north, north central. And he followed up on his intelligence. Got he got he got he got, he got, he got a unit. It was inserted about two miles, no, two days walk from the North Vietnamese border, or close to there too. And his men were put in. He took them to the camp. They uh, took out the guards and freed about. I'm trying to remember. There were about 80 prisoners there. None of them were Americans. Americans had been there, but they were, they'd been moved. About 80 were there originally, 30 immediately fled into the jungle. The rest uh, he brought back, they were extracted, and uh, it was the largest POW rescue operation in the entire Indochina War. Wow. 
the in conventional operations, these SGUs also uh, were thrown into the, the breach of battles in places like uh, the Plain of Jars. That's up in the north, <coughs> northern district. Uh, it's called that because uh, whichever people lived there a long time ago uh, covered this whole area with uh, I don't know, the water jars or whatever, what their purpose was. It's called the Plain de Jars plain, plain jar in, in, in Francaise. And it, uh, anyway, that, it was a avenue of advance from Hanoi to Vinchon, if they chose to go that route. A lot of bloody fighting there. But the, they attacked the Hmong uh, positions in that area. The Hmong were led by an uh, unusual individual. The, he was a general, Vung Pao. He was a Hmong leader. He was a traditional Hmong leader, and he also held a title of general in the Lao army. And the North Vietnamese uh, respected him as, as, as a capable general, but there was a lot of bloody fighting there. And SGU battalions and uh, regiments were flown from the rest of Laos into the Plain de Jar uh, for various battles, one of the biggest ones being in 1971. And they held on to the area. So uh, they distinguished themselves not just in guerrilla activity, but in, in, in fighting as light infantrymen. But they, 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 they took heavy casualties over time. I'm trying to think so, of another operation uh, that, uh, where, they, they, where they stood, up, st stood out. Uh, there were quite a few. But uh, anyway, they, they, they carried their weight during the war. Are those recorded, or where were where were the who kept the records on those? Right yeah. now, the record is uh, it's just history record that uh, talking to people who, who were there, who, who were involved in, in the operation. Uh, I don't know how well recorded uh, some of these events were, but you have to you have to find out. If there was an operation somewhere. So many aircraft were called in to support it, and then. Uh, what units were involved, and then you go for, go from there and find out who was a, who who did what to whom, and 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 and. Uh, when, when you were in, um, excuse the, when you, you flew in Laos, and then also when you were moving around, were you identifiable by what you were wearing? We wore sterile fatigues, no rank or insignia, no absolutely no berets, nothing that indicated special forces. And same with pilots and the planes. And the it depends on, on who they were. Okay. There, there were pilots who, 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 were, who wore sterile uniforms and others, uh, their, the normal uniforms. I don't know uh, what, uh, what guidance they got for that. Uh, much of the flying, just for transportation and, and supplies, came from a private pr a company called Air America that was contracted to work in Laos. And they have some stories to tell. Mm -hmm. Did you get to know any of those yes, pilots? Yes, yes, uh, certainly did. Yes, uh -huh. and uh, they were very good at what they did. But they, they, they did not they did not engage in bombing or or actual battle. But they moved people in and out mm -hmm. uh, as as needed. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I hear a lot about that. Not specific. Yes, uh huh. And not people that know them. Hollywood made a lousy movie about Air America, so don't don't uh, <laughs> don't don't rely on that. Maybe we need a new movie. Yeah. Well, no, but the, someone wrote a book that they were involved in opium smuggling. You know, uh, you have to have a story, you know. So that, that's that's how that came about. But that, that you could have smuggled. Uh, I could have had opium on my backpack when I got on Air America aircraft. So yes, it could have happened. I don't think that was there. They weren't, they, they, weren't, they weren't about smuggling opium. Mm -hmm. So how long were you there? Totally? It was about a six or seven month uh, uh, assignment. It ended in December of 72. Uh, mm -hmm. And we were pulled back to Thailand and uh, given other assignments within the unit. And where did you go from there? Well, I stayed, I, I stayed in Thailand another year. I commanded a, uh, in the Army, it's called a headquarters company, a support detachment. It's just kind of administrative. Mm -hmm. uh, organization that takes care of the rest of the, of the battalion, and that came to an end in January of uh, 2000. No, 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 January of uh, 1974.
during this time, did you stay in touch with the state, with family and Oh, yeah. Friends? I wrote, wrote, I could write letters and, uh, of course, with, right now, I saw, I saw some news of uh, Stars and Stripes and uh, uh, I listened to the Voice of America. Mm -hmm. But you couldn't say where you were? Did you, did no, you know no, where I, you were? I did not tell my parents where oh, I was. Okay. Or tell anyone else for that matter. Okay. Uh, I assume they figured it out. But that 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 uh, that was the that was the Lyle saga. Uh, I found that my what the Thai language that I had learned, we had a little language course in Thailand. Thai and Lao are similar, so uh, you can speak Thai and, and and be understood for the most part. They they could even understand my Thai, which is it's nothing. Sounds like you've, you've kept it up a little bit, or? I, I've tried to, yeah. That, when, I, when I speak to him, I try to convert my time aloud. It just doesn't work very well. So where did you go from there? Uh, back, uh, my, my assignment was to the U.S. Army Training and Doctrine Command. It was a new, it was a new, new headquarters. And that proved valuable in a number of ways I did not realize at the time. But the Army was re- organizing it, well, restructuring its training and organization. They felt that they had gotten too uh, limited by the Vietnam straitjacket, trying to fight a war like Vietnam, when their real mission is to keep the Russians out of Europe. So uh, they wanted to go back to conventional tactics, and how do you fight outnumbered and when? A lot of really forward thinking going on, a lot of studies and uh, Tradoc was headed by a, a general named William E. DePew. He's, he's not a household word. Most people in the military don't even, don't even know who he is these days. But he was a, a forward-thinking individual who initiated a number of reforms with regard to training and organization in the Army that, that, still, that still exists. And so our, our Tradoc got copied by, uh, by allied, uh, allied armies uh, to some extent because they thought it was a good system. I, I think still is, I've, I've not been associated with trade-off, I, I don't know what they're doing but right now, but uh, I, I thought it was, a, it, was, it, was a, it was a major turnaround. And it showed itself during the Gulf War. Uh, someone said, we, we didn't win that war in four days. We won it in 15 years, from 1975 to 1991. Hmm. So when did you come back, back to the States? Well, I got back in 74, and I was a trade-off for oh, uh, maybe a year and a half. But I talked to the infantry branch and found out that uh, I had some goals I wanted to achieve in the Army. And we talked about it, and they informed me, you probably are not going to achieve those goals. So I transferred to the reserves. I had a good reserve career, at least in my view. What year? 1975. Uh, What'd you do in '75? Well, went to graduate school, a place called Thunderbird. There we go. Uh -huh. Turns out we're yeah. both alums yeah. from the same place. So yeah, we were about uh, what forty years apart or something. A little bit, uh -huh. give or take a few yes. years. Yes, yeah, yeah. So how and how was that? Was it all military at the time? Thunderbird, no. Thunderbird was uh, it, it, it was it was excellent. Um, mm -hmm. Wasn't military, but I'm saying uh, were a lot of people former military. There were four, yeah, there were former military mm -hmm. people there. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. That was an interesting year there. And I chose uh, Chinese because I thought that would be the uh, next coming area. Maybe it was, but I'd never set foot in China after studying Chinese. My next big overseas experience uh, took place uh, in the late 1990s. Uh, Mm -hmm. Place called Yugoslavia. But that, that, that was a civilian uh, position. A defense, I worked for a defense contractor then. Okay. And we were involved in conducting the train and equip program for the uh, well for the Bosnians and the Croatians. I was involved in Bosnia, so I worked out of Sarajevo for four years. One of the highlights of my life. Wow, that's interesting. So you continue to put your cultural interests yes. to use. Yes. Yeah. No, I, I really like working in Bosnia. It was a little austere at times, but uh, it was, I, I enjoyed that assignment. Mm -hmm. Have you stayed, how have you continued to stay active or 
calling on your experiences or talking about them uh, allows and have you given some talks and presentations? I have done that, but uh, I haven't talked about Laos so much because it's not something most people uh, have high on their interest list. Really? They're, they're, the they're, Secret they're, War? You don't find people ask you about that? or Not much. I'm going to be another old fogey veteran who talks about some, some aspect of his life that no one knows anything about. Mm -hmm. Are you involved in any veteran organization? Oh, yes, and veteran-related organizations. Of course, I mentioned the Association of the Vietnamese Airborne, mm -hmm. the, we call ourselves the Red Hats, because we're War Red Berets. Uh, my, my friend Cal uh, has a group called the Royal Lao, what is it here? It's a long name, Royal Lao Army Special Guerrillas Association. And uh, they have had some events, and I, I went to one in Minneapolis, it was well attended. General Vesey, who had been involved in, 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 in Laos at that during my time, uh, is operating out of Thailand. He's been involved in, he's involved in activities there. Uh, became the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff eventually. And he attended Lao, uh, Cal's uh, celebration. Wow. And there were some dignitaries from uh, uh, Minnesota. So it was, mm -hmm. a, it was an impressive uh, event. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, got, I've got your question. Were you asking? Oh, oh. About your veteran organization. Oh, yeah, that's that's one. Involved. That's the second one. And I, I belong to a group called the Vietnam Veterans for Factual History. Uh, it's uh, organized by a uh, Vietnam veteran in Houston named Steve Sherman. He's a publisher. He's put out all kinds of uh, uh, books, publications on, on, on Vietnam, on the, on the war, trying to correct misunderstandings. And uh, most recently, I did some research out of the National Archives. Uh, Steve had some documents that had been uh, declassified, and uh, the, mainly the ones that ones he, he'd been working on were uh, after action reports by the defense attache office that was allowed to function in, after the Paris peace talks in, 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 in Vietnam. So the, the, the DA office could uh, kept tabs of everything that was going on in the country, the, 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 the training, the, the equipment, the quality of everything, everything how, how, how the Vietnamese army was performing. And it goes from 73 up to 75 to the very end. But the trouble is, a lot of these, these, those re these reports were declassified. Uh, horrible copies emerged. So I was at the National Archives helping find the original copies and reproducing them, sending them to Steve so he could, uh, he could complete his books. So were these CIA documents or, or uh, U.S. Army? Uh, the the but, defense, just defense okay, overall. Out, out of shape. For Air, Army, Air Force, Navy. And they're very interesting. Very good, very good. And one can learn a lot from them. Uh, and you can see the, the defense attaché is begging Congress, give us more supplies, we can hold this thing. But they wouldn't, uh, mm -hmm. that, that didn't happen, we know. So that, that was, that's, that's been my little contribution to the Vietnam veterans of factual history. Mm -hmm. Is there something that, looking from the people that you've talked to, and just now that you would like to, that somebody should know that they don't know or, or ask that yes. they don't ask? We're trying to find ways to assist the veterans, Lao SGU veterans who fought for us, uh, fought for us in the sense that they tied up North Vietnamese and Laos and killed many of them, who otherwise would have made it to South Vietnam and killed Americans and our, our South Vietnamese allies. And uh, they don't have any, they have, they have few rights, I think Minnesota allows them to have burial rights in, in Minnesota cemeteries, military cemeteries. But they, they don't have burial rights in our cemeteries, which consists of just uh, their urns. They, don't, they, don't, they, they, they generally cremate themselves. 
And we haven't had any luck getting that. I've, I've, I've uh, pounded the halls of Congress uh, trying to lobby for that, and nothing, we're not, we're not making much progress. And uh, many of them just, uh, are having severe health problems, that is, this happens to all people with age. And they, um, getting medical treatment is mm -hmm. a problem for them. And we feel we owe them something. And it's simply been very difficult to get any type of legislation put together that would uh, uh, include them and give them some type of uh, benefits for what they did for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, even acknowledging, I mean, that's a step at what you're doing right now. Yes. Talking about them acknowledging their contribution yes. is, is a recognition that I think will be appreciated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so, I mean, that, yes. that goes a long way right there. Yeah, certainly. Um, and it sounds like you continue to stay in touch. Oh, Your yes. Your friendship with, seems to go all the way back. A lot, of, a lot of people that you're still in touch with that are still alive. Certain ones. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I got a message from Cal this morning, to be exact. Okay. So. And who uh, there? Can you name any? Are there any other people that you remember or that you're in touch with that um, might be able? I might later run into. I can think of one, but I don't know if he has. He, he was a distinguished officer. He was a Sante Raider. And uh, he left the army in '75 or so. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, he's done well in his construction business. I don't think his mind is back on that era, in spite of his, mm -hmm. his own uh, outstanding uh, record. And what about a, just this is just jumping up to a young person today that's considering military service? What would you say? Depending on his interest, if he, uh, if I think he has the aptitude and orientation for special forces, I would certainly encourage him. Because that's, that's really about working with people. In fact, war is about people. And special forces is especially about working with people. Hmm. Uh, language, understanding, psychology, the culture, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's just something, it's, it's an area that uh, uh, the U.S. military is not as good at, it's a, nearly as good as it could be. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds like you, you did a lot Jim, and also just sharing all this information is really truly valuable, and people are asking questions. Mm -hmm. So I know it'll be it'll mean a lot to people to be able to just even listen to the details that you've been able to share. You know, we don't hear that much. Yeah. This is you know great to meet somebody in person who was there, and and luckily thanks to the hepatitis needle, yes, that, uh -huh. um, you survived. Mm -hmm. You're here with us today, and. Um, so if you have any message, anything you want to share, or other than, I mean, you did, you've spoken up a lot uh, on behalf of the Lao people, because it sounds like you had some lifelong friendships mm -hmm. that remained, that are invaluable, and then your cultural interests as well, which is just great. Well, I'm, I, I get particularly incensed when we stab an ally in the back. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the way that the Afghan withdrawal, of course, stands high in that. In that category, but the we, we left a lot, lot behind. But the uh, uh, our temporary abandonment of the Kurds in uh, northeast Syria, and that that was a political decision. But uh, I think we backtracked on that and, and 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 more or less made up for it. But just people who worked with us, who took us at our word, believed us, and then we turn around and and leave them. Swing in the in the breeze. That 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 type of thing really gets to me. Yeah, I understand that. Well, you've expressed it so, and we just thank you so much for Sir. all that you've done and mm -hmm. for taking the time to come meet with us here yes. and contribute. Because this is for the record, so it's been great, and I've learned a lot. Yeah, so thank you so much, Jim. Thank Thanks you for so all you. your service. Uh -huh. Thank you.